Miguel Paredes is a prisoner in Texas. If the state has its way, he'll be dead within the hour. This is Execution Watch. Huntsville, Texas, death penalty capital of the Western world, where prison staff is preparing to put Paredes to death by injecting him with a deliberate drug overdose. During the next hour, KPFT's Execution Watch will broadcast live coverage of the killing in Texas, the state responsible for more than a third of all U.S. executions. Execution Watch host Ray Hill, legal analyst Jim Skelton, with criminal defense attorneys Susan Ashley, Larry Douglas, Mike Gillespie and Jack Lee. Huntsville reporter outside the death house, Teresa Gutierrez. Houston vigil reporter, Dave Atwood. Featured guest, the condemned man, Miguel Paredes, who recently gave Execution Watch an interview on death row. We will broadcast it uncut and unedited. His extended final words. The Execution Watch begins. And good evening, this is Ray Hill in the studios, uh, Studio B of radio station KPFT in Houston. We're not on broadcast tonight. You can only hear us on the Internet, uh, or if you have an HD radio, you get us on KPFT HD3. This is the last execution for 2014. It seems kind of ironic, but uh, the death machine in Texas takes a holiday uh, in recognition of the world's most famous execution, that of Jesus Christ, uh, and we don't execute anybody until January, in which we have got a plethora of people lined up. It should be quite a killing show for you beginning early next year. My name is Ray Hill, and this is Execution Watch in Houston, Texas. This show is only broadcast whenever Texas uh, decides to execute somebody in its death house. Tonight, uh, the person being executed is Miguel Paredes, and uh, I interviewed Miguel earlier, and his interview will be played uh, during the course of today's show. And the whole thing is being videotaped by Mark Pirtle, uh, the premier staff producer over at Houston Media Source, and you will be able to not only hear this show in audio, but you will be able to see this show and the interview with uh, Miguel uh, on HMS uh, whenever that is prepared. The deal we have with inmates when we interview them is that I raise my hand, the interview begins, and we do not edit anything between that and the end of the interview. That's the only way we can deal with that, honestly, uh, is not by editing. Uh, we have a telephone uh, reporter in Huntsville, Texas. I understand that Teresa Gutierrez is there. Teresa, are you there? I am here. Okay, tell me what's going on in Huntsville. Well, we have about uh, 35 uh, or so anti-death penalty protesters here, and w about 10, 15 seconds ago, Several of the Huntsville employees and others crossed from one building to the next in preparation for the execution. It was a, a very chilling feeling. Uh, uh, people are very sad and both outraged by what's going on here, and there's a somber air. But it is interesting that we have signs that say, honk if you're against the death penalty. And I have to say that out of uh, ten car, every tenth car that passes, I would say seven of the cars honk and show their opposition to the death penalty. And so this is uh, uh, an important development. We have to continue to feed on this, continue to build on this, uh, and organize against the death penalty. But, so it's a somber air here, but um, the movement to stop the death penalty continues. Can you characterize the vigilance? Are they uh, family? Are they friends? Are they... Um... Uh, the family uh, of Miguel Paredes is not here, uh, uh, but we 
I, I don't know exactly why not, but there's families of people on death row that are here. The one Barbera's family is here. For example, there's some students from the Justice uh, Department at the University of Houston, as well as HCC. There's several uh, anti-abolitionist groups here. Uh, so we have a total of 35 people when we drove out here. Uh, organizers were saying that they'd be happy if it was five or ten. So the fact that we have 35 people here, I think, is very important. Uh, somber air, but uh, well, that uh, that ongoing is ongoing chance against the death penalty, and as I said, well received by many in the community here. This execution is right on top of the Houston march to end capital punishment. That's correct. And uh, you're an activist with Texas Death Penalty Abolition Movement. How would correct. people get in touch with your organization? Uh, they can call 713-503-2633. 703-503-2633. Uh, 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 Teresa, uh, welcome. This is your first appearance on Execution Watch. Uh, keep an eye out for us, and if there's anything happening there that we need to be aware of, uh, call Elizabeth, and, and we'll get you back on the air. Great. Thank you very much for calling. Thank you very much. And, Bye-bye. Uh, so that was a report from Huntsville. The witnesses have crossed the road. That is a surefire indication that the procedure is beginning. Uh, Miguel is currently in the death chamber and strapped down with needles in his veins awaiting the other witnesses. Uh, while uh, uh, Otis, who is engineering for us tonight, seeks to get in touch with the demonstrators here in Houston, understand they're out on Alameda and Holcomb Boulevard uh, at the uh, convent out there. They're beside the road. It's light enough for people to see their signs, and uh, uh, we'll get a report from there, probably from Dave, uh, uh, if uh, we can contact with him. Dave is here, so uh, we're going to go. Okay, so we got Dave. Okay. Okay, I can't because I'm in the studio. Okay, Dave is here. Dave, you're on the air. Hello. Hello. Is this Ray? Yes, you're on the air. Okay. Where are you, and what's cooking? Well, Ray, we're over. uh, We changed our location for. The vigils were at the corner of Holcomb and uh, uh, Almeida, just outside uh, the Dominican Sisters' place over here. But we're out on the corner, and uh, we're doing our regular vigil, our protest. Um, we've got a, um, a photographer from Belgium that's over here. He's in town to uh, interview uh, mothers of people on death row, and he just came over for the vigil today to take a few pictures. But we're doing what we always do, and that is protest the death penalty. Okay. How many folks you got out? We got uh, seven. Seven today. folks? Not that many. Okay. They got 35 in Huntsville. That's uh, a good thing. And they're getting a lot of passing cars honking in yeah. support of abolition position. Uh, uh, okay. uh, Dave, uh, 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 you attended uh, 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 events here in Houston about the march. How did that go? Uh, oh, the march went good. I mean, there were a couple of marches. <laughs> yeah, I know. I keep up with them all sometimes. But, yeah, I mean, that's just another way of, of letting people know that you disagree with something that's going on and you want to change. And so we're uh, – it's, it's good. I mean, all the marches are good. And uh, so um, I was up today up at uh, Lone Star College giving some uh, – talking to students about the death penalty, too. Uh, a program up there called Living Library when you go up and you talk about, you know, what you're involved in. And so that was a nice which, afternoon also. And I just barely, just barely made it back here to the vigil. Which uh, Lone Star campus? Uh, Kingwood. Kingwood, okay. Uh, uh, you are an activist with uh, the Texas uh, uh, a Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty. How do people get in touch with your organization? The best way to get in contact with us is to go to our website, which is tcadp.org, tcadp.org. Texas Coalition uh, to Abolish the Death Penalty, that's the acronym. Uh, Dave, uh, we're going to go on with the show, uh, uh, and uh, so you give our regards to the vigilance. I will. Thanks, Ray. Thank you. 
And uh, uh, let me see. Uh, Jim, what happened in this case? Well, it's kind of crazy. It's This involved really a kind of a controversy between two rival gang members in San Antonio over two ounces of cocaine. According to the opinions, the cocaine is worth only $800, and it led to the deaths of three people. Hmm. What happened, there was a man by the name of Adrian Torres, who was a member of the Mexican Mafia. And he was friends with a guy by the name of John Sines, who was a member of what they called the Hermantos Pistoleros Latinos. Well, they became friends because Torres had gone to school with Sines' wife, and they become pretty good friends. So Torres fronted, and what I mean by fronting, he gave two ounces of cocaine to Sines to sell. And, of course, what he's supposed to do is sell the cocaine, keep a few prop money, much money for himself, give the rest of the money back to Tories. Rather than selling the cocaine, Signs made one feeble attempt, then he and his wife ended up in a motel room in town snorting all the cocaine. So what happened at this point, Torres, Torres is angry. He wants to find his cocaine. Cocaine is not there. So he goes by the house where Torres, where Signs is living, threatens Signs' niece and says he wants the money or the cocaine and said, look, I'm a member of the Mexican Mafia, and left the impression that he was going to do very bad things to Sines if he didn't get his money or the cocaine. And he was going to come back on a Sunday to either get the cocaine or get the money. So at that point, uh, Sines calls his brother Eric and wants Eric to bring over $800. Eric wouldn't show up. Turns out Eric is an informant for the police. That's the reason he probably didn't show up. So what happened when Torres is going to go to Sines' house to collect the money, Signs in turn calls a couple of members of his gang, one of whom is Miguel and another kid by the name of Greg Alvarado, and they're called for it really to do an ambush. So what happened, one of the kids stays, one of the kids stay in the garage with a shotgun, one goes in the bedroom with a shotgun to wait for the arrival of Torres and some members so-called the Mexican Mafia. In fact, what Torres does, he ends up showing up with his girlfriend and another guy who sat in the car. Torres comes in the house. They have a controversy about not buying the cocaine. At that time, Miguel is hidden in the bedroom. But the other guy, Greg Galvarado, is hidden in the garage. And then the woman and young man, they get him and them inside the house. And at that point, according to signs, he claims one of them tried to pull a knife. And so he shoots Torres in the back of the head a couple of times. At that point, Miguel comes out. At that point, Greg Galvarado comes out. And they shoot and kill the girlfriend and shoot and kill the other man with the girlfriend. Jim, is it normal for uh, rival gangs in a, in a bad dope deal getting executed in well, Bear this, County? That's what's strange about it. The reason I think this was not a gang-related thing to begin with, because Torres was real good friends with Sine's wife. They knew each other that way, and I think that's how it got started. And then it kind of evolved to rival gang members, because after the shooting occurred, uh, Miguel made some threats about we'll get the rest of the Mexican mafia and we'll wipe them out and did all that kind of hero talking. And that's what happened. And after they did the killings, they have three bodies to take care of. They call fellow gang members. They clean up the house, roll the bodies up in carpet, take it out to a, a little adjoining county called Frio County and set the bodies on fire. In the meantime, signs his brother, who's now dead, signs his dad. His brother Eric calls the police. Because what happened after the shooting took place, Signs calls his brother Eric and said it's taken care of. And at that point, Eric knew that the three men had, that there had been a killing, so he notifies the police. And then the police start tracking down all the people involved in it. And in that particular case, the gang members, all the gang members that helped bury the bodies, came forward, testified for the state. And there's little doubt about guilt or innocence because. Eric testified as to what his brother had said. There were numerous witnesses that helped do the burying the bodies. They all testified, and there's little doubt that there's no question about guilt or innocence. Well, Big argument is punishment. We've got three victims. Right, and the victims' names were Nellie Bravo, was 23 years of age. She was Tori's girlfriend, a kid named Michael Kane, 23, who apparently was just along for the ride. Then we had Adrian Torres, who's a member of the Mexican Mafia. They were the three that were killed. And you have three perpetrators. And three perpetrators. And all three perpetrators got death sentences? No. What happened is all three of them were tried to begin with, had tr charged with capital murder, and, of course, the aggravating factor were multiple murders committed during one transaction. Signs goes to trial first. He gets a life sentence from a jury. Now, Signs is the snitch's brother. 
Well, Signs is the one that set up the killing. His okay. brother is a snitch. Okay, he's, uh, he's, the, one know, that, the, he's the, the one that snorted the brother. cocaine. Yeah. He set up the murders. And he did he the first shooting? Out. Yes, he did the first shooting. And uh, so then where does Paredes, Miguel, come in? He, he is tried after that. He gets a death penalty. And after that occurred, and apparently Greg Velasco, I mean, Greg Alvarado got scared and cut a deal with the state, and he signed up for a life sentence. He pled guilty. But a jury found Signs guilty, gave him life sentence. A jury found Miguel guilty, gave him death. And then they, at that point, Alvarado pleads and gets a life sentence. And of the perpetrators, Miguel Perez is the youngest, we think? The youngest of all of them, apparently. Okay. He was he was 18 and, and one month old. He had some juvenile problems? Before. Yeah, he had some juvenile problems. Susan's going to discuss his background okay. on what went through in punishment. I'll let her discuss that with Okay, you. but if this crime, if this incident, whatever it was that killed all these people, had happened... 32, 33 days before, he would be, be constitutionally it, ineligible absolutely. for execution. He would just barely old enough to get the death sentence. And it's kind One of month. ironical that the man that set it all up, the man that called in the backup, the man who had the beef, walks away with a life sentence, and the guys at the backup gets, one of them gets the death penalty, and one gets life. And this has been cooking for, what, 12, 14 years? Yeah, he's been on death row. It'll be 13 years in December. be 13 years in December. So yes. presumably the others have been locked up for a similar length of time. Absolutely. They'll be eligible for parole sometime after they've 40, been there 20 yeah, years, when they 40 get, years? And when they get eligible for Social Security, it's going to be about the same about time. About 40 years, same time. So I'll let Susan discuss okay. what happened Okay, why, why don't you bring Susan in here? Okay, and, 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 uh, uh, that was Jim Skelton, who is uh, kind of the wizard of the bunch and looks the part and plays the part, and he analyzes these things. And uh, participating, we have a series of other lawyers we're going to bring you right now. The lawyer will bring you, Susan Ashley. Susan, tell me something about uh, Miguel's background. Okay, well, at the punishment phase of the trial, the state had put on evidence that Miguel had committed another murder and that he participated in still another murder and that he was involved in a drive-by shooting, and he was also involved in another drive-by shooting. He's just giving them this information? Or do you think they had it and confronted him with it? I, well, I believe police probably had that information, okay. and they put it on probably through police officers or you know other investigators. But it wasn't, those weren't tried, the other homicides? No, these were... Un, you know, unadjudicated yeah. offenses that they would put on at punishment. And, of course, the defense lawyers could, wh whoever the witnesses are testifying to these unadjudicated offenses, the defense lawyers could cross-examine them the same as they would in a regular trial. So there was a drive-by shooting and then another shooting where, I guess, two people were shot with an assault rifle. Um, there was a aggravated kidnapping and a DWI, and also there was something like a trespass and, I guess, carrying a firearm. That that was that. Those were the other those, offenses. Those were the offenses that yeah, they had. That they and, put and most of these were juvenile offenses. Or well, happened when he was a juvenile. It, 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 no, he went as a juvenile. He went to TYC. But don't forget, he's fairly, I mean, at the time of the trial on this case, he's young. Yeah. So it would have to be in a short, you know, I mean, all this, obviously. All this happened in a relatively couple, it would of, have to be couple in a, of years. It would have to be in a short time yeah. frame. And defense lawyers, there was no direct evidence put on in mit for mitigation at punishment. Although at some point defense lawyers apparently argued that he, his parents had 20 children, that he was one of 20 children, that I guess seven of them died before he was born. And he was born, I guess the family lived in Chicago, but they ended up you know, moving to San Antonio and they lived in a housing project. You, you could certainly assume it was a very a poor family. And that where they lived in the projects, gang activity among young men was common. And so defense lawyers did argue that at some point, but there was no direct evidence put on in, in mitigation at punishment. Well, we're going to take a, uh, an analysis of the trials and the appeals and, and the legal environment about that. But uh, Otis, are you ready to play uh, Miguel? I interviewed Miguel, and here is the tape of that interview. 
I'm talking to Miguel. We're on uh, Polunsky in the visit room, not far from death row. Hi, Miguel. Hi. Hi, Ray. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, we've been chatting before, but we're going to yeah, pick it up and go there. Uh, Miguel, could you give us some idea of what your life was like before this case? Well, that's a long one, right? Because <laughs> it's, it's kind of, it changes from one side to another side to another side, but the most, I was pretty much like a wandering soul, you know? And I always wanted to live life and experience this, experience that. You know, like, pretty much when things used to cross into my mind, I pretty much ignored, took the risk willingly to go live that experience. You were 18 years old? Yes, I was. When this case came down? When this case came down, yes, I was 18. If you had just started a year earlier, you wouldn't be here and we wouldn't be on the schedule? Oh, well, actually, a month earlier. <laughs> a month earlier. Yeah, because I, oh, a month and a half, more or less, because my birthday is on August 8th, and the case happened in September 17th, so it's a month and a week, give or take. So, so yeah. So you were just barely 18? Uh, barely 18. And they didn't cut you no slack? Well, they really didn't cut no slack. They really, what they were doing was trying to portray me as bad as they could. So. Yeah. And But you're not the only person involved in this case? No, nah, it's three other people. What happened to the other two guys? Um, the one that owned the house, um, he got a life sentence after he went to trial. And the other person that was charged, he signed for a life sentence. So they're both serving life sentences. And as far as you know, they're still in prison? Uh, yes. Uh, I think John Anthony is serving three consecutive life sentences. So they'll hold him a while? Yeah. He ain't going nowhere. You got a family? I, I got a lot of family. Talk about them. Well, I got my son, as you seen him, walking out. And that was my older brother, Miguel. And my niece, she was in the car. But they didn't let her in. And I have 12 more siblings and people that I love is family. Such a big family. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And counting the nephews and all them is like 50 something. I think 49 or 50 something. In the, in the close circle, there's 49 or 50. And between the, the siblings and the offspring, the, the sons and stuff, is, is yeah, it's about. About 50 something. And you're the only one locked up right now? Yeah, I'm the only one locked up. I'm really the only one that has been locked up. Did you get involved in gangs and things? Is that what this is about? Well, in this case, yeah, I was involved in gangs and gangs. And uh, I've been involved in gangs since I was like about 12 and a half. And then I got into a prison gang right before I turned 17. And pretty much that's what got me over here. It's kind of a downhill slide getting involved in gangs. Pardon me? It's kind of a downhill slide to get involved in gangs. Yeah, but sometimes when there's a lot of people at home, it's like it's very difficult to have the, the right amount of time to give each child and stuff. And any little problem, even if it's small, it could go into a big problem because there's so many people to give attention to. So. Pretty much, especially where I grew up, is people, I was more inclined to meet people that were involved in gangs and stuff like that, so that was pretty much the people that I came to be close with. Now, I left, I left um, the gang life for like about, I think close to about two years or something. When my son was conceived, that's when I pretty much stopped all the gang activity from the street gang. and. I lived, and I still got sent to TYC. And when I went there, I had a couple of fights and here and there, but pretty much I tried to do everything that I had to do to come out, and I did come out. And when I came out, I pretty much just dedicated myself to trying to raise him and spend time with his mom and live the family life. So after a while, that broke up, and I couldn't see him no more. So. I went back to my old neighborhood and little by little started meeting people that I knew from before and they were already in prison gangs. So 
that's when they pretty much invited me and we got in there and from there it just went down you. Mm -hmm. so. what, what has it been like on death row? How do you get along with the other guys over there? I get along pretty good with most people. I get along pretty much with most people. I mean, it's really what you want to make it to be, you know? So it's like, it's up to the person, how do you want to see it? Because I've lived, lived uh, I look, I would say like about half of my time, and disciplinary and stuff like that. And then when I started growing spiritually, I just slowly but surely started letting go about a lot of things. And it's, I've been able to be happy, to be able to be fulfilled, you know? And it's like, I've come to understand love, to know how to love and how to accept pain that comes with loving and how not to close myself and how to focus on the things that nourish people. Like when somebody, when I see somebody down or with a problem or something, I try to analyze that person and see where I could help them at. Now, that's to me, it's an opportunity to redeem ourselves in a way and to learn to love because here we have the car stacked against us, but at the same time, there's a huge opportunity to literally love people and to come to know people because when you're out there in the world, you're rolling around and especially if you're a strong character person and you know how to get things, it's like you live life as whatever I want to do, I could do it, you know? It doesn't take that much to get whatever you want as far as like materially. But people are gonna, you're gonna have a lot of friends, a lot of people that claim to love you and all that. And as long as you have what they want, is it's all good. But once you ain't got nothing, once you're in prison, it's like you see a lot of people that claim to love you, they you kick their way, they you did crazy stuff with, it's like out of sight, out of mind, you know. So when people come to you here, they know that you don't have nothing. In other words, the way that I used to see it sometimes, it's like being a ghost. You know how in the movies. They show the goals that's invisible. He can't be touched, he can't touch, but he could see. He could feel in some of them, like the emotions and stuff. And some people manage to speak to them, but they can't have an interrelationship like a normal human being could, like physical and stuff like that. So here, we're locked up in the cell, and I used to say like a concrete tomb. And we're no more different than goals because no matter how much we come to love and to feel for other people, it's more what happens in the inside that happens on the outside. But at the same time, when we're out there in the free world, we forget about that. And even, even law-abiding people, they forget about what's really important. Now, there's, there's this experience where you learn to accept death and you learn to live. And one song that reminds me about that is Tim McGraw's To Live Like If You Were Dying. Now, that right there, it's as close as I couldn't experience it and say it because you literally let go of a lot of things and you literally learn what's really important in life. And a lot of times, it doesn't even take the physical aspect to show love, to have love for somebody. And you're able to appreciate more when you're down and under, when you ain't got nothing to offer, when you know that the person that comes to you, that they love you because you really ain't got nothing, you know? You ain't, you, you can't have that physical uh, stimulation or gratification and do this or do that or give them this and that. Nah, it's just, just pure love, you know? You can't offer them no more than what you carry inside. You mentioned earlier, uh, while we were warming up for this interview, a couple of guys that were friends of yours that was executed, and you listened to the show during their execution. Yeah, I listened to Jones and Arturo, and I learned to love with them. And as far as in here, because we we came from similar backgrounds, some of us a little bit worse than others, and sometimes I say that we were like stray dogs. Now that even if people try to domesticate us, we weren't trying to hear it. 
and society as a whole they see us as a nuisance that we have to be eliminated that we have to be euthanized you know so it's no more different than a stray dog that's a nuisance to society now when I was running around as a kid and I would pick up straight dogs. No matter how much you try to show them affection, they would burn off. But somehow we manage to come to love people a lot more. And even ourselves, that we weren't perfect and had a whole list of defections, of flaws. We, we learned to accept each other the way we were and to grow with each other. The circumstances that we had to go through, losing family members and seeing the raw reality of the gang life, you know, and seeing what it really leads you to and the hypocrisy in it, and all those types of stuff. I learned it with them and they learned it with me. We learned to, to actually see truth for what it is. So those experiences, it's like with them, I had the, had the bonding, the relationship that I wanted as a kid with my family, but when we really were truthful to live that out, it was it was very different than um, gang ideology or philosophy. It was it was a philosophy out of love, you know. So when I grew with them, it's been like about 11, 12 years. We started knowing each other, so we went through good and bad, and times of feast and times of hunger, as I used to say sometimes. But when we learn to love, it's like, instead of being quick to get in trouble, we were quick to tell each other, hey, this is not useful. This is it's only gonna bring you harm or it's gonna bring you harm. Formed a support system within. Yeah, and, uh, but it had nothing to do as far as gang life, you know? It didn't, because intimately, we, we disagreed with a lot of things and we learned the, the raw truth of it. But that's that was a growing step for for me for them and I got to to honestly look at people and feel the the brotherly love not not as in uh, oath loyalty and stuff like that but as 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 I would like to say like the fruit of the spirit where it says by loving forgiving being patient being kind to people and. When, when you look at the fruit of love, it's gonna bring nourishment to the next person. But when you look at it in human terms, materialistic ways or gang ideology and stuff like that, it's gonna bring harm to them. So that's how we pretty much kept in line what was healthy for us and what was not healthy for us. You know? So I was able to live that experience and learn that experience basically. I read somewhere that in this process of your being on the road, you wrote a letter to future death row inmates. Yes. What was that about? And tell me about it. Pretty much it was about really looking at reality, you know, because a lot of us, especially Mexicans, we come with this attitude, the fightful attitude, really, like you have to pretty much be strong to survive, to live, and you let out the anger, and you let out pretty much all the, the negative energy that you have and it's like when you're living in in a way like that you're you're looking at the guard not as a person that has kids and family but you're looking at them as you're pretty much a green reaper you know and somebody trying to take your life so natural instinct natural animal instinct is going to be going against them hating them and re releasing either how they say, either fight or flight, you know? So a lot of people, they see it that way. They keep this hate towards the system and to the people they, that are against you. And it's... Did you write that in English or Spanish? I wrote it in English. I wrote it in English. Is it available? Is it, you know, where you... When it's, it's in Minutes Before Six. Minutes Before Six? Yes. Which is a website. Yes, it's a website that it allows prisoners to put really what they want to write and feel that they want to share with the world, you know. And it's uh, in your name? Uh, it's, it's, it's the, the letter, it's on my name. You can find that under my name, but there's, there's a lot of writers. Yeah. On that webpage. Yeah. Yes. So it, it is on my name and it also has. So you, so you, you, you've been a part of a larger community than just the people around you on the road. 
Mm, I have tried. In the outreach. Do you, do you expect that what you had to say in that letter would be beneficial to another generation? I expect it to be beneficial to a person that has to go through the same struggling, the same, same experiences. In other words, to learn from another's experience is a lot easier than we just go blindly. And it saves you a lot of time and it helps you, like if you see, it tells you about appreciating the people that reach out to you, not to just use them and stuff, but to appreciate them. And a lot of people appreciate them and we come to love them. And that's, it's, it's more in hopes where people do not waste their time spinning in circles with useless things, but to really appreciate their own life and this experience being right here on this road, the, the time is gonna click and that time is gonna stop one day at whatever time they decide to put that needle and execute us. So it's not time to be gambling no more. It's no more time to be what if, what if that, and wasting time, you know? So that's, that's, that's my, pretty much my output on that. Miguel, this has been the most amazing interview in the series I've done. And I know it's the most amazing because I've had fewer words to say and you have carried the load. You know, personally, I did not prepare for this interview and the way that I see life is pretty much in my personal beliefs is letting the spirit talk to me. Now, that's, that's what I'm being led. Now, I can, I don't, I don't try to uh, force my beliefs on other people, but that's, that's the results. The crazy stuff, that was me and I was experiencing that, but what you're seeing right now is, is, is the gift that I've, I've been able to receive while I've been here. Well, when both of us have been dead for 500 years, there will still be an electronic copy of this <laughs> in the universal ether or whatever people are left to see. Yeah. And I think you can be very proud of your taking good advantage of this opportunity. No, no, thank you. Miguel, for I don't want to do this show. Hey. I want you to tell your lawyers to do everything that they can do. I'm trying, I'm so trying. So that I don't have to do this show. You know, I'm trying. And, and I want you to know that I care very much for your family. Thank you. Not because of what you said, yeah. <laughs> but because I saw your son's face yeah. who left just before I got here. You know, I noticed that you were reading his face and I thank you for taking that opportunity that life gave you to look into his eyes, to look into his facial expressions. My kid, he's not one to show his motions like just how once once he don't want to show them to you your papa you know but the strangers don't matter that much you know last time it's like a couple of weeks ago he came in i had to open his heart up and it was painful it was a painful experience but it was the most productive experience because i was able to allow him that he does have feelings because he had wrote me a letter telling me that for me to tell him what's going on with me and that he had heard that I didn't want to find out. And he had told me that he did not feel no more. He had been through so many things. So I saw myself in him and how I blocked so many emotions, how I blocked so many opportunities to love. But seeing his eyes when he was little and seeing my mom when her eyes were pretty much leaking and showing all the pain inside, that's what made me understand that I don't live in a little box and whatever I do, either to other people, it has an effect on everybody else. So it ripped my heart when he was a little kid to see him and I'll ask him, hey, what do you want for your birthday or Christmas? And he'll just be pointing at me in his eyes. You could see what you saw in his eyes today, but there was a time when he could not tell me I love you back no more. Until that time when, a couple of weeks ago, I think, when I told him everything and we cried together and it was a magical experience because in his eyes I could see him and I could see like if he was seeing my eyes and we we're looking inside each other but everything now is blurred it out and uh, that experience right there we were both crying and it didn't matter if it was an ex stranger here over there or over there we were just lost in that connection but that night after six years when I told him I love you right before he left, he was able to tell me I love you too. That was something that he had not been able to do for six years. 
at first I thought he was growing into a little man, you know. Like he felt a little bit complex telling me, I love you, but in the back of my mind, I knew that something was going on inside him. But for me, hearing him say, being able to say that he loves me, and even though right now that it's painful for him, for him, he knows that he is able to have those emotions. So it's difficult, but he's, he's raw material right now for people to love him and for him to be receptive. And that's what I'm thankful for. It's like, I have tried to do everything in my power as far as legally, and I am trying, but at the end of the day, really, for me, death is just crossing the line. In my beliefs, I have eternal life, and in this part, I have people that love me. They do not want me to go, and I could help them in certain ways. And in this side, I have people that love me also, where I'm just gonna be resting and loving, but it's the walk that I walk from one end to the other end, crossing that line. For these people that I love a lot, that they want me here, it's gonna be very difficult. But we all have to cross that path. Now, the best thing that I could do is share with them what I have in me here. The How old are you now, Miguel? I'm 32 years old now. Yes, sir. So you spent almost half your life in this box. Uh, pretty much, pretty much. I'm gonna close off the interview. Okay. You were beautiful. I uh, think you. Praise God, thank God. Because <laughs> no human being thought it was possible. Everything that we've said is not going to be edited. It's going to be played exactly as we did it. Okay. And you have done a remarkable job. And like I said, thank you. Using just many minutes. And, okay. Um, I, uh, when I put it up, because I know your son will be listening to it. Yes. Maybe not right away. It may be too painful for a while. Yeah. But I want him to know that I consider you my brother. Therefore, I'm his uncle. <laughs> okay. I appreciate you. And I love you, too. Yeah. I love your strength. I love your growth. Thank you. And thank you very much for thinking about others. Yeah, thank you for doing what you do for all of us here and for the people out there, too. Well, give my regards to the boys. Okay. You too. Okay. Take care, and God bless you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> And that was Miguel Paredes, and uh, that was an interview. And uh, it will stand of its own weight. Uh, this whole thing is going to be wrapped in video and be shown later on Houston Media Source. But right now, uh, and we're going to uh, we're going to go over and see what uh, uh, Mr. Gillespie see what uh, he's got to say. Mr. Gillespie, what is your piece of this puzzle? Well, Jim asked me to talk about why one man got the death penalty and the other two did not. The issue here is the first man that was tried, Mr. Sines, mm -hmm. got three life sentences. Three stacked? Not stacked. Three life sentences yeah. in verse to be one. The problem is it was his ambush. He was the one who took the cocaine. He was the one who snorted the cocaine. He was the one who didn't pay the money. He was the one who was threatened with his life. He was the one who brought those men over with guns. And when the people came to collect the money, they killed him. Why does he not get the death penalty where this young man is getting death penalty? Well, wouldn't he have had a self-defense claim of some sort? That's my position. My position is that in his world, that is self-defense. He owed the man money. The man came to his house, made a threat to him. Him and his girlfriend were sleeping in motels to avoid him. The man came to the house and said he was Mexican mafia and they were going to come back for the money. There's an argument that in his world, he wasn't fear for his life. I think that was a factor in him not getting the death penalty. But the most important factor is not that. The most important factor is that to get the death penalty, you have to show a continuing threat to society. That this is not a one-time situation, that if they do not give you the death penalty, you will continue to be a threat to society. This man had no prior violent acts that we saw on the record. We didn't even see if he had a criminal record. By all accounts, this was his first violent act. Whereas this young boy, tonight, yeah. had multiple murders before he was okay. e even an adult. He is a continuing now, threat to society. As a lawyer, you are liable to show up in a courtroom and have to represent any one of these people. All right. Yes, correct. And your job as a lawyer to represent, say, uh, Mr. Sign, right, uh, is to perhaps put the focus on Mr. Paredes. 
so that you interest your client. And so I, I trust that there were three different lawyers, but one lawyer didn't represent all these people. Yeah, but there were different trials. Yeah. So oh, you different trials. didn't have the chance to do that at this time because okay. they were tried separately because of this man's priors, he gets a separate trial. Yeah, but you would have talked about Mr. Paredes if you were trying if you were the lawyer for Mr. Sines and if you were solving Mr. Paredes, you'd talk about Mr. Sines. That's correct. That's the way that works. That's correct. And again the problem is I feel that this boy did too many murders and involved in too many murders before he was even an adult that made him people consider continuing threat. Whereas Mr. Sines, he might have prior history being in a gang, but we could not find any in our research. But since he could be put in a situation that he was forced to do this to save his Mike, own life. can you think of a point in time when someone might have intervened and saved this kid? I think a point in time, a kid was only one month an adult. Yeah. At any time, anybody reaching out to a young man, what impressed me about this young man, not only what I heard from his mouth today, but his words talked about he wanted to feel part of a group. There's so much about young men that want to be part of love and part of a group of other men. And a gang is a piss exactly poor right. substitute and, for that. Well, it's not a poor substitute. It's what it is. Except there are gangs like baseball gangs and football gangs and basketball gangs and Boy Scout gangs that people do not get involved in this kind of activities. But when you don't fit in with those kind of gangs, you revert to this kind of gang. And that, do I think he could have been saved? You heard him. You heard him. Yeah. Okay. Very. We won't answer that question. We'll let the bureau listener do the that. The purpose of jail sometime is supposed to be to be alone with your thoughts, to rehabilitate yourself and change. That's what the Quakers thought about. It didn't work very well. Yeah, but I hear this. <laughs> but I hear this boy talk, and I see that's why people would think that because introspection is the key to this. Thank you, Mike Gillespie, you. for being the lawyer you are, and the human you are, and the heart that you are. And here's Larry Douglas. Uh, Larry, could you have represented any of these guys? Um, it would have been difficult, Ray, uh, to really. Well, the, the thing is, the um, prosecutor was trying to get the death penalty for as many of them as, as, as they could. Sure. And the, the, I'm here to talk a little bit about the the, the hearsay rule. Okay. Um, and this is an interesting case because we're talking about gang violence, two gangs competing. Uh, but the, the, the distinction that this case raises is that you have John Anthony Signs and Eric Signs. John Anthony Signs, the, 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 the sergeant in the Pistoleros. Yeah. And Eric is a, an informant. Yeah. So a lot of times, the reason you, you don't get to get the death penalty in cases like gang uh, competition is that you don't have witnesses. Here we've got a witness. That being a, a, a an informant for the police, and one so, of the, one of the principal's brothers, and and he because he's in in that position, he gets to tell the whole story, and prosecutors like to have witnesses that they can control, like police officers. In this case, an informant, and but he wasn't there, so they've got to get around the hearsay rule. They let him tell the whole story of what happened. Eric tells the story. Eric's the primary witness because he talks about what John told him, what his brother told him. And so he talked about what his brother told him on the telephone regarding the, the, the lead up to the murders. He talks about what his brother told him on the telephone after the murders. And that comes in without any objection. That this clearly hearsay on the telephone. Then when they get together person to person, eye to eye, he tells the story again in the presence of uh, Miguel Paredes. And he tells the story in the presence of Miguel Paredes. And at that point, the defense lawyer raises an objection. Unfortunately, at that point, it wasn't hearsay because the conduct that Paredes exhibited at the time brings it out of the, the definition of hearsay because, because Paredes, being a party, he actually adopted the statement, the whole comment by, by, uh, by Eric the hearsay he he adopts it by his action. That is, he because what 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 uh, what Eric says that John John Anthony told me that they shot three different people, shot three people, and then actually that uh, Peretti shot two of them. Peretti sat there and listened to that and didn't say a word, and 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 but didn't say anything to refute that statement. 
So once he says nothing to refute the statement, he's then adopted well, the statement that, by it, his conduct. That's not some 18-year-old kid's problem. That's his lawyer's problem, isn't it? It is. Okay. But, but but beyond that, when the statement was adopted by his failure to, to refute the statement, he goes even further and tells Eric, you should have been there. You would have had a good time. We're going to come hard on these Mexican mafias. We're going to put them down. Okay. I think those kinds of statements, when they got in to the evidence, that's what got him to the death yeah, penalty. Yeah, pretty telling. That's what got him to the death penalty. But, but, but it's interesting that, that the hearsay the, the, that, that was objectionable did not draw an objection, but the hearsay that was not objectionable <laughs> did draw an objection. Uh, but 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 the, since since Paredes was right there and didn't say it didn't happen, he actually adopted the statement that I shot two people. Okay, thank you, Larry. We got to get Jack in here and see what Jack's got to say. Jack, uh, you got a piece of this puzzle. Summers in here. Yeah, I w- I, w- I posed the question. Um, the in fact, the same question that you posed to Larry. What could you have done? Could you have represented uh, yeah. Paredes? Well, you're a lawyer. Tell me. It would have been really hard for exactly the same reasons that Larry said. You've got a guy who, frankly, there's he's got a criminal history. He's got a criminal history of violence, of murder, even if it is unindicted. Furthermore, you've got a, a statement where he comes out, where he says, you should have been there when we murdered them. You would have had fun. When a jury hears that, it's a very, it's a chilling statement for them. And because, because he didn't say, oh, no, 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 that wasn't me in the private conversations, that hearsay statement is no longer hearsay because he adopted it. He didn't object to, oh, no, 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 I didn't, I didn't shoot them. I didn't shoot them. And so, so a, a it, denial on his part would have been strategic necessary to protect. Yeah, it would have been. because. And how do you tell a gang member, oh, by the way, in case that you're ever caught and in case this goes to trial, you should start denying all the things that you did? As opposed to, I mean, if, if somebody had said, hey... Well, they, they need an orientation program. <laughs> right. I mean... and I this set is, that up. I don't know how to do that. And this is a situation where a gang member, if anything, would try to puff themselves up and say, oh, no, I did even more than that. In fact, I, I shot John yeah, F. Kennedy. It's, it's the culture, yeah. Exactly. And so it's, there's not really a whole, um, frankly, the, the, uh, the trial attorney didn't have a lot to work with. In fact, we just found out not that long ago that in punishment phase, no evidence was, uh, no mitigating evidence was brought up. No, nothing was tried to. They didn't talk about the, the twenty kids. They didn't no, talk about the family. Not one bit. And again, this is what could you possibly do to convince the jury that? Oh, his statement about you should have been there. You would you would have had fun. How do you how do you soften that blow? It's real tough. Well, I've got another hard thing to talk about here. Uh, It is now five minutes till the end of the hour, and I have to inform the listeners that the witnesses have not left the death chamber and crossed the road. That means that Mr. Pettis uh, has been on the gurney now in excess of 40 minutes. The last time something like this happened... I'm putting you on the air. Hang on. The last time this happened. Okay. Uh, hello? Hello? Hi, this is Teresa. Yeah, Teresa, what, what is going on? What is not going on well, up there? Well, as you all know, uh, this is extremely unusual. Uh, we're chanting. We're trying to find out. We're asking that they tell us why this has taken so long. But obviously something has gone wrong. We just don't know what. We don't know if it's botched. We don't know if they're experimenting with new chemicals or or what it is. We're well, chanting and asking for them to tell us something, and they're not. The press is out there waiting. The guards around us are just standing still without commenting, without answering our well, questions. Well, they don't. They don't know anything. Uh, what What's going they don't on? Know. Right. Nobody what's going knows. on in the death chamber is uh, uh, the according to my reckoning, he has now been on the death chamber. Uh, uh, more than 40 minutes. 
since yes, the use. Just a second. It seems as if they're coming out right now. Okay. The execution has been carried out. Uh, we need to find out why this took so long. Of course, we know this is a crime no matter what, but if this was a botched or experimental execution, we must uh, oppose it even further. So it is now almost 65, and they are just now coming out of the uh, of the uh, area, and the family's coming out, and the, the press is getting ready to uh, shoot as everyone comes out of the, the chambers. Um the the crowd here is extremely upset by what is happening. We are tense, and, and the families of the a, okay. uh, people who are on death row. Are Teresa, Teresa, uh, yes. uh, when the witnesses are accessible, uh, ask them what's going on and make sure it's that e- well. either you or Gloria get in touch with KPFT News for their news report tomorrow evening. We certainly will. Thank okay, you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate the role that you have pay, played. Sure. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. This is Ray Hill again, and I, uh, uh, I am distressed that it has taken over 40 minutes for this man to die. That's the only reason, because after the execution, the prison system clears out the death chamber very quickly. They don't want people hanging around in there. They've got a contractor to come pick up the body and take it to a nearby church so that the family can feel the warm body when that happens. Uh, and uh, uh, so we just received word that uh, Mr. Paredes took over 40 minutes to die from the uh, execution, and that is an exorbitant amount of time. Ray Hill... We will have a report on that whenever the video is made, and we'll try to get something on the website when we get information. Thank you very much for listening to Execution Watch. I want to thank the lawyers, Larry Douglas, Susan Ashley, Michael Gillespie, Jack Lee, and, of course, Jim Skelton. I want to thank Mr. Paredes for allowing us to interview him. I want to thank his son for surviving, and I'm in it when I'm available for the boy. Our next execution will be Rodney Reed. Our producer is Elizabeth uh, Stein. Our uh, uh, technical director and wizard is Otis McClay, who's actually engineered tonight's show. My name is Ray Hill. Oh, it's being videotaped by Mark Pertle, uh, the staff uh, producer at Houston Media Source. Stay tuned. Listen to the Facebook page. Watch the website. We'll get it up as soon as we can. Thank you. Bye. Don't you know they're killing people? Don't you know they're killing people?